<laughs> Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Text before us, morning, John's first epistle, we read from the second chapter, beginning with the third verse. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is a message that you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. His truth is seen in him, and you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness, does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, have you ever paused to think, did those sheep appreciate their shepherd? You think of the 23rd Psalm, takes them out to green pastures, leads them beside the quiet waters, takes care of all their needs. Those sheep understand that. That there wasn't enough to eat, they started ban like crazy and causing all kinds of ruckus. They would go off on their own and uh, get lost and such like that. And the shepherd had to take the extra time to make sure that he'd bring them back in. An interesting thought, isn't it? Kind of a silly thought, I suppose. When was it that you understood what your parents did for you? Well, they were just supposed to take care of all my needs, but they were supposed to supply everything. I, they were supposed to, I was supposed to have a house to live in and food to eat and clothes to wear. They were supposed to just provide all those things for me, right? When did you really begin to appreciate what they did? Were you 10? Were you 20? Was it after your few years with your first child? And all of a sudden it began to, to dawn upon you what sacrifices they made, what efforts they made to, to provide for you and take care of you. And I know we have situations where people live in broken homes and do not really know the love of a parent, and that's a really sad thing, but this does not destroy the principle. <coughs> We aren't sheep, but we have a good shepherd. Have you ever paused to reflect upon all that the Lord does for you? Or do you just assume, I've got my wits about me, I've got strength, and I've got stamina, I'll just go out and do my work, and I provide, I'm my own person. I make my own way in this life. We had an interesting comment at, well, actually a question, at Bible class the other morning. When did Jesus become real to you? You, you knew the stories. You were taught them in Sunday school. Christmas, who doesn't know of Jesus' birth? Easter, who doesn't know of the empty tomb? When did it become real to you? Did Easter become real after you lost someone very special in your life? Did Christmas become real when you put aside all the gifts and the Santas and all this kind of stuff and could look closely and to see that this was the beginning of God's promises being fulfilled that he'd made about a savior? Yeah, I put those questions out because they are interesting. They're even interesting for myself. When did this become all real to me? And I'm not gonna stand before you and say right out of the, the crib. It didn't happen. But as we grow and as we mature, we begin to pause to think and, and come to know our Lord better. And that's really the point of the first three verses of our text this morning. How do we know him? You know, 
you, you might know facts, you might know stories, but do you know him? Paul said, the greatest thing, my greatest desire is that I might know him. Let's go to the Apostle Paul. I mean, here is a person struck down on the road to Damascus and, and had all this, this guilt within him. The Lord is actually teaching him for three years in the wilderness. And yet he can still write, my greatest desire is that I might, that I might know him. Good shepherd, son, we get a picture. We get a picture of a caring shepherd that, that suffers all the abuse and all the ridicule and all the, the complaining and bickering and, and such like that. Yeah, if you come from a multiple children home, uh, how many times have you said, I don't know how you put up with us when we were fighting like that when we were young. We were just always at each other. We were just, you know, mad at each other and then carrying on and, and you were always the peacemakers there and such. Uh, do you know that God does that every day in your life? You have all these emotions. You have this pent-up anger, this, this jealousy, this greed. Oh, some days you can handle it real well and you keep it within yourself. But other days it just kind of explodes out and, and such. Do we forget our, our good shepherd? Do we forget our Lord? And that's what the Lord was, was impressing upon us through John's writing here this morning. A second thought. When did John write this? Probably at least 50 years after Jesus spoke these words to him. We look at John's epistles and John's revelation as being some of the last books of the New Testament. Sometimes the books of the Bible don't always go in chronological order time-wise. But about 50 years after Jesus was preaching and teaching, these words were still embedded in John. That we might know him, that we might know him by obeying him, that we might obey him and have that obedience to him and to his will. Over and over again in scripture, if you love me, you'll do what I say. We try to teach that to our children right off. If, if you love God, you first of all obey your parents. You honor them. You will submit to them. This was something that John just, it was part of him 50 years later. It was a message that, that was just made such an impact on him. And all too on each of us. God wants us to love one another. God wants us to love him and to know him and to know all he's done for us and for our salvation. And God has given us ways that we can measure that love, if you will, if you want to use that term. And that is by his commands. So if you truly love God, you won't take certain of his commands and say, I don't want to follow those. I would much rather do something else. I will follow this one and this one and this one, but those, um, no, that's not love for God. Love's not picking and choosing. Love's not saying, um, yeah, Lord, I'm good on those, but uh, you know, you know, I'm a little weak on those. We're weak on all of them, to tell you the truth. We need his strength. Also, to love God means that there has to be an effort. The old story of the marriage counseling, that they've been married for 25 years, my, my husband never tells me I, he loves me. Well, I said that to you when we were married. Nothing's changed. We need to, we need to, to say things. We need to, to, um, to understand that it's an effort. It's always an effort to, to show God love and to discipline our lives to follow his will for us. So do I love God? Do I love him enough to honor him by doing what he has commanded? You must walk in his footsteps. He says, if you love me, you will walk in his footsteps. Do as he did. You know, sometimes we, what would Jesus do type of thing, and we start to pattern our lives like that. We almost make it look as though if I'm doing that, then I'm pleasing God and such like that. I think more so this is being said not, not to kind of have me pattern my life. It's, it's more for me to understand that Jesus is not asking of us anything that he did not do for us. 
He is not asking us to love our enemies when he himself did not, when dying on the cross, pray for his enemies. He does not offer or ask us to sacrifice of ourselves or do anything of ourselves that he did not first do for us by sacrificing his exalted state to take on this humble state to live for us. And so as we look and as we read the pages of Scripture and we see certain things that the Lord asks of us, oh, those are hard sayings. Who can do that? Oh, wow, we live in different times and, and such. The Lord has done it first. And we pattern our lives after him. The old commandment and the new commandment. He makes an issue of that here in the text. The old, uh, the old command is a message you have heard, yet I'm writing you a new command. The truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing the true light is already shining. The old command is still there. Moses knew that as, as he wrote his books and as God gave him the commands, we should fear and love God that we, and so on. Old Testament love was a love for the covenant, a love for God. What was missing in that was a unselfish love for all. And that was what the Lord taught us on Calvary's cross. That this isn't a love simply because God has commanded it. It's love that I willingly give from my heart to others. That's the new command. Love your brother as I have loved you. And you say, well, that's a, a difference without really a, a distinction without really a difference here. And, and no, it's not. It's like um, you are to love your teacher and obey them. <coughs> all right, all right, yeah, but they're mean. Yeah, okay. That's kind of like the Old Testament love, wasn't it? Yeah, I love God because oh, God will be mean to you, God will punish, and such like that. When Jesus died on the cross, we see that Jesus died for the unlovable people. And the people that do not even deserve love and that he loved. His love was unselfish and was, was something to emulate. So he teaches us to love one another like that. Not because you've been told to do it. Because that flows from your heart. Faith changes us we say it so many times but but oftentimes it takes a long time for us to understand that it changes my heart it helps me see things that i didn't see before <clears throat> and when i look to and when i know my, my lord and his love for me and i see what he has done for me it, it just it changes my outlook on things that's the power of the holy spirit working in our hearts and then that, in a sense, is that new commandment where God, God gives us that, that tremendous desire to want to serve him. And so, if I hate my brother, and when I use brother there, just a, 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 my fellow human being, when I have a hatred for, for people, then the love of God isn't in me. How in the world could I hate someone that Jesus died for? How can I hate someone that I'm praying for? Either I'm not appreciating Jesus dying for them or I'm not praying for them. And that's what our text is telling us. If you know God, if you know your Lord, then you will be filled with that desire to do it. But notice also it says the darkness has been as is, is, is there is is slowly being overcome by the light. I, I really appreciate that thought there. My, my life without Christ is complete darkness. But as the gospel and as the word begins to fill our lives, the light begins to shine. <laughs> And we see things. And the thing is, I'm reminded of the darkness every day because there are things that trigger my anger, that trigger my greed, that trigger my hate, that trigger this or that. And I realized that is, that is foolish. That is simple. Why do I think those thoughts? Why do I do those things? And the more that we are being filled with God's grace, 
the more that we come and hear his word, receive his sacrament, the more the Lord fills us with his light. We begin to see things. How many times don't we say, I wish I would know, would have known when I was a teenager what I know now? How many times have we looked at the things in our life a whole lot differently than we did back then? The only thing we knew were our passions, and we knew a little bit about Jesus. There was a whole lot of darkness. But as we grow and we learn that um, these things are but just fleeting things. They don't last. There's no lasting value. There's only one thing that lasts, and that's my Lord Jesus Christ and the faith that I have in Him for my salvation. And so the light shines. The light shines in the darkness, and it's, it's continually pulling me out of the darkness into the wonderful light of our Lord Jesus Christ. To get to know Him. Not just facts and stories. But to get to know the love of God in Jesus Christ, your Savior. And look at that cross and every time know he died for me. He died for me so that I might live for him. That takes it and that helps me to grow in my knowledge and my understanding of him. Amen. <clears throat> now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.